And we are back for the final talk of Inclusive Design 24 2022 that's been brought to you with the generous support of our platinum sponsors, Fable and Intopia, and our gold supporters, UX for the Win, TPGI, and Barrier Break. A reminder, you can find us on Twitter. Our account is at ID24Conf. And if you have questions for our presenters, please feel free to tweet them with the hashtag ID24 or post them in the live YouTube chat. And we will ask Josh and Maureen questions at the end of the session. Meantime, I'm going to hand over to my most excellent co-presenter, Crystal Preston Watson, to take it from here. Thank you so much, Leone. And I just want to say thank you so much for letting me be in part uh, and guest host this. I am very honored um, to be able to do so. And I am also really honored to um, present our presenters uh, for the final session, um, uh, Maureen and Josh, and they'll be talking about building UX research practices for inclusion. All right, hello and welcome folks. My name is Maureen Barrientos and my pronouns are she, her. And with me is Josh, pronouns he, him. And we're so excited to be here to talk about building UX research practices for inclusion. And you can go ahead and check out our slides directly and follow along at bit.ly forward slash inclusive dash research. Okay. So before we start, we want to set the scene by kind of showing you an example of research that is well-intentioned, but not exactly inclusive. So look no further than Bill Gates's Reinvent the Toilet Challenge, a very much well-intentioned design competition that was created to um, redesign the toilet and that would lead to a more inclusive, accessible, and safe sanitation services for um, individuals from rural and poor communities. And we're gonna review just three fundamental barriers here to inclusion inside this research. And first let's take methods slash tools. Uh, this university took a, and I quote, research field trip, that's exactly what was used in their uh, publication, to conduct workshops and interview participants in India and they grabbed those findings and flew them all the way back to their labs where they conducted iterative design sprints based on these concepts and learnings. However, all this solutioning was done without testing and involving members from the Indian communities that they, that they visited. So that's first uh, red flag here and let's move on to the next one. So second issue here is looking at the researchers, researchers and our identities. So Take a look at the man that was awarded the first prize for this competition, a white male engineer from California Institute of Technology. How we want to we want to question here how might his role, his identity, his personal interest and education level maybe shape his universe this universal toilet that many folks in the end can't afford nonetheless fit in their homes. And problem number 3 with the research here and I'm crediting Josh's amazing meme game here. Um, pictured is a sleazy dude with questionably raised hands about to pose a prob uh, an offer for you. And on one side, you have the research institutions who get the grant money. They conduct the haphazard field trip. Um, and rather than quality, than doing quality or ethnographic research, and they gain the international fame, the publications, and that get that handshake with Mr. Gates. And on the other hand, you have you, the actual communities, who have no say in the design and get the toilets that they can't afford and that are completely unmaintainable, not adaptable to your environment and your needs. And this conundrum, this all could have been avoided if actual underserved com communities had a say from the beginning to the end of the design process. Okay. And this is kind of the agenda for our talk today. We will talk about, sorry, for the next few minutes, we'll be deep diving into the same three issues that I just covered before um, and pose those barriers to inclusive and uh, UX research practices. So those 
three method things are methods and tools, um, identity and biases of the researcher, the system, and throughout our talk today, we'll also provide tips and resources that may be helpful in your journey towards building more inclusive research practices. So I'll hand it over to Josh now. All right, y'all, before we go deeper into those three subjects, we want to take a pause here by introducing ourselves through a subjectivity statement. Let me move the slide on. A subjectivity statement is basically just a summary of who you are in relation to what or whom you're studying. We write subjectivity statements to acknowledge that our subjectivity can and will filter, construe, and misconstrue our work. We're going to be using it in our introduction to one, help us identify how our personal and professional standpoints may affect this presentation, and two, better convey our identities to y'all, our audience, to evaluate our credibility. So what's up, y'all? I'm Josh. I was drawn to my current work as a civic tech accessibility designer as I grew up as a military brat and an immigrant, single, disabled parent household. That being said, I am very privileged as a temporarily abled East Asian male in tech. As such, for topics on inclusion, disability, and more, I can only really hope to be an advocate, not a representative, and definitely not an expert. In the future, I hope I'm not the one giving this talk, and that more opportunities and the equitable space, time, and pay can be carved out for brighter, more talented folks uh, to participate in. How about you, Maureen? Thanks, Josh. Um, I'm Maureen Barrientos, and I am a first-gen Latina in tech. And my research and my analytical skills, my nerdy talents, this is all used to conduct research, which is my social practice. And I've been on academic and government and industry research uh, teams. And in all these spaces, I do tr strive to understand how outdated systems and tools can be improved uh, to provide more accessible, equitable experiences. And I recognize my privilege as an educated, abled person living in the Bay Area. It's a place that has afforded me a lot of opportunities to work in these spaces in health and now um, industry, and just wanted to note that. And in summary, what we're saying with our statements today is that we aren't experts, we are biased. Nothing that we're talking about is new today. And we have all citations in our slides listed if you want to revisit those and read for yourself, that's great. And we also want to acknowledge that our human beliefs, they're all socially situated. Josh are in really unique places in DC and uh, San Francisco, so this presentation may not apply to all contexts, and we want to note that. All righty, folks, it's time to dig in. We're going to start with chapter one. Our tools and methods are the problem. Um, we're going to discuss about how stuff like designers using empathy mapping to understand users' needs, like Drake miraculously fixing Lil Yachty's laptop with a click of a button, might be a little bit sus. So let's start with tools. Cue the classic printable PDF paper form example that asks for what signature to participate in the study, a tool we may use in our recruitment. For those folks out there focused primarily on dimensions of race, they may forget that a wet signature can erase those of intersectional disabled identities as well. That may unintentionally exclude, say, trans disabled assistive technology users. And that's why we're coming to this very obvious tip. Uh, the first thing that we have here is document how tools may exclude or include oppressed communities. Let's try and get into that habit. And that might look as simple as a spreadsheet. As you conduct more studies and as your research practice matures, you're gonna want an easy reference for your researchers to avoid haphazardly selecting tools that are convenient or familiar to them. For example, if you primarily use a combination of Zoom and Figma prototypes for usability tests, who might that exclude? Is that accessible? What are the alternatives? And what recommendations could you provide? More holistically, that might blossom into being able to make more informed decisions on how to select a mix of tools that meet a range of intersectional needs, like providing multiple ways to sign up for a study. But this isn't just limited to tools. Maureen, what are your thoughts on methods? Mm -hmm. So equally as important as the tools are the methods. And conducting research and accessibility at the end uh, or inclusion and accessibility research at the end of a product life cycle, that is like going to accessibility for a comprehensive user test. And 
bottom line, it is a temporary fix to something that's a deeply rooted problem. Um, so let's move on to learn how we can do more. And we'd like to encourage teens to first incorporate inclusive research practices earlier in the life cycle. Uh, we've heard the idea of shifting left time and time and again, and we're trying to veer away from conducting this reactive damage control, waiting to be called out uh, by your audiences or waiting for that impending lawsuit to come up. Um, we, are, we wanna think about our users with disabilities or those who hold, hold marginalized identities at the discovery phase? Are you inviting them at early concept testing? Um, are you testing prototypes with them that are still very rough, uh, you know, rough shape? So folding in inclusive research and testing these and doing these practices early on, uh, those findings can have very far reaching effects. And I do wanna comment on unmoderated and automated tools or methods and for product teams who have limited resources or bandwidth, the idea of using a third party company is appealing. You hand them your research requirements and the report shows up magically in your inbox. And however, automated accessibility testing, this does not cover the breadth of guidelines and requirements set by WCAG. And research even shows that these tests are prone to false positives and even errors meaning you need to go back to a human again to provide that verification. Um, as for moderated studies, not being able to communicate to your participant in real time and be there to ask them follow-up questions and understand more deeply their lived experiences. With unmoderated tests, you do tend to miss out on these rich human insights. And now we're taking an example and looking at uh, card sort tasks. So here I've got an image of Emma here asking on Twitter, have we considered that the whole concept of card, card sorting is very ableist in nature? And if you were to use a card sort, that means you are making broad assumptions about your participants' uh, traits, abilities, cognition. So tools just like methods are bound to include and exclude different groups. People are complex and it's important to think about that when we select our methods. So in this case, with the closed paper card sort, if you are evaluating you know, how well an existing category structure supports your whole site, um, you might wanna start asking what other tools or methods can help me answer that same question. And some methods here laid out um, include contextual inquiries and online tree testing. And these could help you to get to similar findings. And if one method is ableist or excludes critical user audiences, one might start to solve this conundrum by using multiple methods. So matching different user preferences and needs in separate cohorts, and then coming back and comparing their results. That's methods triangulation. And it's important to remember that research methods and tooling should be flexible and participant-centered not what's most convenient or familiar for the researcher or the team. Uh, question, go ahead and question the history behind your go-to research methods and triangulate those weaknesses by looking towards mixed methods. And as researchers, I also wanna prompt us to think about working with, not on participants. In this slide, I have an iceberg model, model on the right which is kind of a rep the tip of the iceberg is representative of that small one-time usability test, which is just a sliver of someone's lived experience. And this inevitably leaves out hidden critical context. Um, you don't, you miss out on your participants' patterns, behaviors, maybe don't understand the systems that they interact with in their daily life if you see them in a snapshot of time. So this is why I encourage uh, qualitative ethnographic research, actually spending time with participants. All right, and we can reference some co-design principles that will help us reimagine how we might do work with participants again. And to reappropriate these methods, we could also slow down. First, we might want to think about how we could adapt and give people more time to connect. 
And then there's going beyond writing, getting away from those sticky notes. How might we reappropriate methods so that we are thinking about and, and embracing other modes of communication? And lastly, do practice flexibility. So how might we adapt methods with our participants uh, and, and modify those before sessions start? And that all being said, how successful we are at selecting appropriate methods is closely linked to how we sample and the folks, um, how we sample the folks that we've been conducting research with. So Josh, you wanna share your thoughts on sampling? Oh yeah, I, I love this one. Let's talk about sampling strategies. Why? It's probably one of the easiest places to ruin or tank a research study. And that's why I get nervous whenever I hear the saying, it's better to conduct some research than no research at all. I'll explain that as we go along, but let's just go ahead and get started here. In the UX world, you may see folks huddled up in the hallway doing impromptu interviews or usability testing in hopes of catching users where they typically are. Here's my beef. If the only strategy you're using to sample your participants is based off of the ease of their availability, like finding folks in the hallway, that's called convenient sampling, and it kind of sucks. Why does it suck, you may ask? Well, Michael Patton, who literally wrote the book on qualitative research, states, convenient sampling is lazy and largely useless. Making convenience the primary criteria for sampling decisions is dangerous because it can expose your conclusions to serious validity threats. Furthermore, convenient, sample, uh, convenient samples typically exclude underserved communities. And even if they do include them, they rarely produce enough variation to actually understand those groups. For example, let's take the interview in the hallway approach. You may get easy access to privileged folks with a lot of time, uh, a lot of time on their hands, but you may fail to get access to people without time, people who may not speak your language, and people who don't even have access to that hallway in the first place, um, like this meme over here of the skeleton at the bottom of the pool being ignored. Um, that's why I get nervous when folks make decisions based off of some research that was conveniently sampled. It can encourage and inflate confidence in racist, ableist, and often technocentric solutions. So maybe instead of some research is better than no research at all, we should say some research with a ton of risk documentation is better than no research at all. And it doesn't end here. Maureen's got some beef with on-demand participant panels and subject matter experts too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, working with third party testing companies, there are a couple things that we should all be cautious of when we engage with these companies. And the first one is to beware of pro professional participants. Um, these do exist and they are individuals who may, con may participate in usability studies back to back to back. And that means that they have tons more design knowledge and, and language than your targeted user has and may be prone to biased responses. Um, next is you want to also ask companies those hard quitting questions or you know the person doing your recruitment. It's important to know how they're recruiting and performing um, these tasks, who they are recruiting and how they're screening participants from where, what are the, where are they pulling from? And in order to be accepted into a participant panel, um, I've learned that participants do have to have a high quality internet. Some may have, have, to, have to have access to a breadth of devices like mobile, including tablets too, and assistive technologies. So that's just not representative of maybe your target user. And lastly, consultation with subject matter experts. This is, yes, a great way to identify glaring issues, but let's take their recommendations with a grain of salt. Um, subject matter experts are unrepresentative of our users again here, and they are in charge of a very narrow topic and know much more about it than your target users. And they also work within your organization, so that will produce bias inherently there. And they're also highly um, technically savvy. So this means they might not know about the workarounds or the exact pain points that your true user audiences endure as they use the product. So let's be careful about assuming that we can solve a bunch of disabled experiences into a session and have an expert tester with a fancy $3,000 equipment complete these tests seamlessly. Uh, we wanna make it more close to like a real, real experience. 
And so let's avoid making, in summary, strategic decisions off convenient sampling. Instead, we'd love to see more key decision making based off rich qualitative research and purposeful sampling strategies that are going to prioritize intersectional needs. And cited here is Michael Patton's book. There, inside there are 40 plus, more than that, uh, purposeful sampling strategies. And we just can't get these to these today, but we would love to invite you to go check it out. All right. In simpler language, what we're trying to say is that when it's possible, your team should really try to conduct your own research where you're being really picky about who you recruit to achieve a particular goal. If you're conducting the study with screen reader users, think carefully about the variety of intersections that might exist and augment that experience. Do they have a congenital or an acquired disability? Do they even identify with a disability? Are they all white, wealthy, JAWS, and voiceover professionals? Get comfortable asking these questions. And if you can't be picky, that's okay. Look, late stage capitalism isn't really big about this kind of stuff in the first place. But what we can do is document who's been left out and follow up on it. On my team, we've implemented a recruitment checker, which was influenced by the matrix of oppression. It's basically a spreadsheet where we have our columns representing uh, participants in the study, and then the rows showing an assortment of different underserved dimensions that they may identify with. Using this, we can document those intersectional identities across samples and include it as part of our research readout. So in a recent hallway test, a team was able to self-report on the lack of underserved communities represented at which point we can start working to fill in the gaps. That's the power of making the invisible visible. And one small note here, it's likely going to be near impossible to include everyone at once in any study. If we want to include as many people as we can in our research over time, we need to be strategic with our sampling and be more flexible with our tools and methods. How might we explore different specific intersections and in strategically sample cohorts over time using different tools and methods? How might we strategically prioritize groups, uh, groups that are more oppressed first instead of last? Maureen's got another nice example to share here too on inclusive research. Yeah, th this study makes me excited, happy, over the moon. And now that we've covered tools um, and methods, I wanted to share with you this study by Carnegie Mellon design researcher. Her name is Christina Harrington. And through purposeful sampling, like we've mentioned, and methods triangulation, her team uncovered that older adults face several communication breakdowns when they attempt to interact with voice ass assistant devices, kind of like Google Home. And more importantly, they, these older adults felt the need to code switch when they were interacting with this voice assistant and asking them personal health questions. So how were they strategically sampling? So Harrington's research team leveraged long-term partnerships with community organizations in Chicago and Detroit uh, to identify participants. And they also you know, went the lengths to posting flyers, visiting local community centers to recruit black older adults from low income neighborhoods. And how did they triangulate methods and work with participants? So onboarding, that was quick and involved uh, questionnaires and you know introduction to the diary study phase, which is phase one. That was a quick five day study to capture you know, what health questions and participants could document that as they come up in their own time, um, questions that might not come up in session. And so that was completed and followed up by phase two, which was a group and individual semi-structured interview about the said diary. Now, this seemed pretty comprehensive already, like and a good place to stop. And maybe teams would have thought that they captured enough data here, but Harrington's team went a step further and went the distance with a third phase. Let's go to that. And phase three was first feasibility studies uh, with participants and this was to test out various questions and commands with the actual voice assistant device. And lastly, participants and researchers and researchers partnered on a co-design and brainstorming section, session. And this was to elicit uh, ideal attributes about Google Home and come up with a list of future must-haves for Black older adult users uh, to make this product better for them. Again, this is a strong example of sampling purposefully, working with participants and spending time with them and cross-referencing multiple methods. 
And this will be in the deck too for your review. All right, so we've discussed the shortcomings of our tools and methods, but we haven't covered one very flawed instrument in this presentation yet. It's me, it's you, it's all of us. Um, let's dig into how our identities shape our access to the field and our analysis. So you might be wondering, wait, 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 why are we the problem? Let's start with some of the basics here. Whether we like it or not, our personal identities can shape the research process. Our own identities as researchers can shape the research process. And we're constantly bringing our own subjective perspectives into that research process. In other words, who's doing the research has a huge impact on the research itself, from access in terms of who we can reach and what they're willing to share with us, and analysis from what we can and maybe cannot see from the data. First, your identity impacts recruitment. It goes about saying that as a Korean American, it's gonna be super easy for me to find other Korean Americans, but it's gonna be significantly more difficult for me on my own to find folks with different identities. That's why when we conveniently sample, we often end up finding folks who think and look like us, which isn't exactly favorable. Two, how participants perceive your identity may also literally impact how they behave. For example, a study examined whether black college students' test performance was impacted by the race of the experimenter who proctored an exam. Students whose test was administrated by a black experimenter scored significantly higher than students whose test was administrated by a white experimenter. That's in White Logic, White Methods. Fantastic book. Three, perceived identity also impacts users' trust and what they're willing to share with you. Respondents may be more willing to share their experiences with a researcher whom they perceive as more sympathetic to their situation. For example, in her research, Ronnie Berger states that her identity as an immigrant allowed her to take a more sensitive and responsive approach to her participants, who are also immigrants, which often yielded disclosure of more personal and deep stories than a more professional distance approach would by a non-immigrant. And finally, your identity can also impact how you construct the world, use language, and ask questions. If you're privileged, you might make the mistake of asking someone like, hey, tell me about your trauma without a second thought. Tying this back to our conversation on methods, I have often heard folks justify the use of having many observers on calls based on their own lived experiences without considering how radically different that may be for participants themselves. They may fail to understand the feeling and even trauma of being an object of research. So what can we do? Maureen, do you have any tips for us? Yeah, that leads us to our first inclusive research tip for this section, us being the problem, the researchers. So suggestion here is participate practitioner triangulation. We love our triangles today. <laughs> and by involving multiple practitioners with a diversity of identities, uh, we can uncover findings that are sort of less dependent on a single researcher's identity. And by cross-referencing our data and our analysis with another researcher, we can reduce that risk of experimenter bias. So the more identities and perspectives present on your research team, the better outcomes you'll have. And we can take this even another step further through participatory research, which aims at mitigating power imbalances, so between the researcher and the participant. And this is done by first building rapport with your participants ahead of time and designing that research plan with them, using language for onboarding, like a bill of rights, sharing questions ahead of time and proactively um, uh, preparing accessibility needs, not accommodations, and also training researchers to be reflexive, maybe even trauma informed. That means that they'll understand the limitations of their perspective and then prioritize your participants' safety and their well being. And who we are shapes our interpretations and thus uh, our analysis of the data. And this is not something to be afraid of. In fact, it's great to start the exercise of reflecting on how who you are shapes the research project and your findings and the analysis. So by understanding your biases, you might refrain from taking participants' words for granted and instead explore them for all their complexities and their meaning. And to mitigate bias in our analyses, we can cross-reference multiple theoretical perspectives, and that's theoretical triangulation. 
So let's take, for example, this quote pulled from Christina Harrington's study that I mentioned earlier. It's from a Black older adult participant uh, remarking on their voice assistant device. So they say, I think that there could be a tendency to speak a little more clearer, maybe to Google Home, than your actual co conversational dialect, where you might change words, kind of, it's kind of like a code switching. We do it all the time, depending on who you're talking to. And if we're looking at this from a grounded theor theory approach, there are various ways to code and review data, and you can get very descriptive or literal with it. And a code might look like user needs uh, to speak more clearly as, as laid out here. Very literal, descriptive, and may not always provide you with a deeping, deeper meaning uh, and engagement into the data. However, if you take another approach and do more so in vivo co coding, this allows you to go a little further to describe the data with the participant's frame of reference. So you, this just goes to show you that different approaches in, in theory and analyzing data can change who is centered in the middle of the research. Is it the participant or your own um, biases? So Josh, go ahead and share member checking. Brilliant. Yes. Uh, for those of y'all who may not be as grounded in grounded theory, uh, maybe a little bit of an easier technique that we can try out is member checking. In plain language, that means including participants not just as, well, observed participants, but as decision makers in analysis. So a couple of things that you can do, uh, pulling directly from inspiration of Sarah Fathala, she wrote a wonderful article on trauma responsiveness and participatory research. Consider sharing your recorded transcripts of your participants for them to annotate, correct, or modify. Make sure that you pay them for it. Extend this to the analysis process. Share your sense of the data back and forth so that they can engage with it uh, and engage with your interpretations and correct you if you're off. I also love this trauma responsive tactic where you can invite participants to correct, nuance, and react to drafts of your research reports to make sure that once again, the interpretation of the data aligns with the intent the research participant had in mind. And if actually including participants in analysis isn't feasible, at the very least, you can write a subjectivity statement, which we covered a little bit earlier in this talk. We can even evolve that into a reflexive process too, which is basically how might we ask ourselves questions and journal throughout a study our thoughts on how our identities shape the research process, our participants' perceptions of us, our relationships with participants, and the research context concurrently. And taking that one step further, how might we transparently share our positions with our participants too? Now that all being said, even if we do all of those things well, we're never gonna be able to reach meaningful inclusion unless we can change the system itself and redistribute power back. So we don't end up in this situation where we have like this team of white superheroes recruiting back another white superhero to join them uh, like organizations hiring majority groups. Uh, to start our final section, we might ask, what is inclusion anyway to begin with? We've talked about inclusive research this entire talk, but we haven't specifically discussed what that actually means. Opening up a dictionary, we might get including everyone, allowing and accommodating people who have been historically uh, excluded. We might also reference the often used mismatch definition of designing with rather than for excluded users. But let's do a quick pop quiz here. Based on those definitions, let's take the situation at hand. You've tested with users of Parkinson's who have left feedback saying your product makes it easy for me. Your website features a blind man quoting that accessibility is the right thing to do. And you quote and showcase an immense diversity of disabled people on your social media pages. Surprise! Well, yeah, by arguable interpretation, accessibility might be inclusive too. And for those of y'all feeling a little vomit kind of crawl out of your throat, trust me, we are with you there completely. Here's the thing. Inclusion in the hands of organizations that are profit motivated and already not diverse is often just a mask for identity capitalism. I think there was a wonderful talk earlier on this. The exploitation of diversity to maintain inequality. As Dr. Leong points out in her book, um, organizations just go for that classic black best friend defense by hiring favorable participants to claim to be inclusive, dust their hands off, and then do the bare minimum or include until profitable, as Josh Halstead puts it. 
In doing so, as Aaron Chu astutely points out, marginalized communities that are inconvenient to profitability, like those of compounded disabilities, intersectional identities, and more, end up becoming erased. So when we include disabled people within the system, who are we actually included? The easy to access, professionally trained, white advanced screen reader user that identifies with their disability? Or the person with a disability that doesn't in even identify with that disability, has intergenerational trauma, and works off of a $30 Android phone? Shout out to Eric. So what can we do? Maureen, any thoughts? Mm -hmm. So this theme of changing and working within the system means reframing also how we think about inclusion. And I'd like to pose, what if we think of inclusion as a core professional competency and not something that's a department in the organization or an expertise? And as a tech industry stands, companies and their product teams, they're the ones who kind of come to the decision on whether or not they'll build and design with inclusion as a principle. Whereas we have other sectors, construction, architecture, um, Accessibility is a requirement. Doctors, nurses are held to an ethical standard. So this is kind of leaving me to wonder where is that in a tech professional? And if you aren't competent in that inclusion practices, in those inclusion practices just yet, let's not broadcast empty words for inclusion or focus on the good only. Instead, let's practice complete transparency and honesty. So Historically, we haven't been a diverse research practice, and if you, but if you are uh, fully transparent about your shortcomings around your inc around inclusion as a researcher or at a company level, and you have a goal in mind regarding where you want to be in three to five, ten years, then you're recognizing a gap, and that's a good place to be to then make um, efforts towards filling that gap. And needing to go. Next is needing to go beyond inclusion and looking towards social or towards design justice. So let's continue to be to push past user-centered design and go even a step further and aim for community-led design practices. It's our responsibility to dismantle these systems where privileged researchers and designers are the experts and, and hold the decision-making power over who's included and excluded in the research. And the goal here with design justice is to continue this change until oppressed community find themselves as their own designers and are representative as their researchers and bear bearers of power. All right. So that was a lot, y'all. I know we're coming up near the end. Uh, but just to recap, the barriers we've experienced in inclusive research might include our methods and tools, which we should document and triangulate to make informed decisions on inclusion and exclusion. Two our identities, which we should check before we wreck our studies using documentation once again, self-awareness and diverse team members, and finally the systems we work in, which we need to mature and foster towards justice, not just inclusion. And finally, we'd like to ask you all, who's building your practice? How might we give up power and practice humility? To cite a recent publication on existen existential crises as designers in social design, we need to become more aware of the intimate connection between design, capitalism, oppression, and coloniality. We should be brave and humble in endeavoring to design otherwise, including who gets to pick, build, and mature our tools, our methods, our sampling, our access, our analysis, and our practices. So let's hire people from intersectional oppress communities, promote them, pay them equitably, and take many steps back if you are in a seat of power. We'll be clumsy and awkward at first, and that is okay. No one's an expert here. We definitely aren't either. And that's why we want to open this up to dialogue, to community, to y'all. So, Maureen? Mm -hmm, that's it. We're, we're certain we made mistakes today, and we would love everyone in the community to talk with us, keep us honest and in check. So let's talk this out and we'd love to see you in Twitter comments or feel free to reach out to us. And we're just happy to have shared this and brought awareness to this and yeah, stoked. Hey. Wonderful.
Thank you so much, Maureen and Josh. That was such a vibrant talk. And I love that idea about approaching things, being brave and humble. And thank you for letting everybody know it's okay to be clumsy and awkward sometimes because I certainly am. And like you say, most of us are some of the time. So that was just a very yeah thoughtful conclusion to an amazing talk. Crystal, I'm sure we're going to have some questions. Yes, we do. Um, our first one from YouTube chat is how much do you pay participants to uh, correct recorded transcripts? Um, what is, they have multiple questions. I'll read it all and you, if you want to take it bite by bite, I understand. Uh, what is a reasonable amount of time to assume it will take for the participants to review the transcripts? That is a fantastic question. And I'm going to actually reflect that back on the person who asked it and say like, why don't you ask that to your participants? What do they think is fair in terms of time, in terms of pay, in terms of compensation? I think the big question that we we need to be thinking about things is being able to reframe it away from us, centering our perspectives and what's convenient to us because we have our nine to five, and instead think about, hey, who are the people participating here? Who do we actually need to create uh, solutions of any sort, right? And how might we center their needs, including how much they expect to be paid, um, or even push that even further, uh, how much time they may need, and more. Uh, I think to point you to some resources that might help a little bit, uh, particularly if you're looking to do more meaningful participatory design, um, we have it, I think, linked within the slides themselves, but Beyond Sticky Notes is a wonderful book. I, I think it came out this year. Uh, it's super wonderful. We cited um, some of the principles uh, that's mentioned within there. It may give you a couple of ideas, uh, but the answer is it depends. <laughs> so thank you so much. Um, kind of keeping going on the uh, participants. Um, um, earlier mentioned um, the risk of professional expert participants. Um, so how would someone go about making sure that they, you know, the agency that they are hire isn't passing off, you know, <laughs> people who are like experts at like testing, like as like general, like, because that, that happens. And, you know, there are people who are like, this is what I do. I am a expert tester and, you know, who may not be someone who of the general public. So um, how would someone go about making sure that doesn't happen? Hmm. I, so in terms of how, I don't know if you can prevent it 100% from happening, but to be aware of it and kind of catch it before it happens, understand from the agency and ask them to see how are they recruiting. Um, you want to see the screener questions. Um, there are sometimes screener questions asking, have you participated in the study? I don't know, in the last three months, I've seen those sometimes in inside of the screener. So get that data. Um, if you were going to hire these companies and pay good money for them to conduct research for you, uh, you should be entitled to understand where your findings are coming from. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a, a good answer is someone who definitely qualifies in the expert tester category myself. You know, this is what I do for a living. I do it every day. I have a disability, but the way I think and report about issues is absolutely not the same as, as someone who, you know, maybe uh, you know, works in retail or, or you know, uh, an accountancy firm or, or some other, you know, other profession or, or has some other role in life. And yeah, I really think that's an important distinction to draw because as, as you very eloquently said in, in your talk, you know, the, the, the responses you're going to get, the data you're going to get is, is going to be massively different and, and not what you're really aiming to, to gather, I think. Crystal, I think you actually, you had a talk um, not too long ago about the price of assistive technologies, right? It's just like an obvious, like easy point, point to your talk and say, look at this, right? And yeah. <laughs> obviously, like the types of folks who can make it to that class of, of testing and, and be able to, to market themselves uh, in that kind of position, what intersections does that erase? Um, so like, yeah, treating it like a job interview, right? It's, it's your money. You're paying that third party yeah. company, get your money's worth. Yeah. <laughs> Good advice. Um, so this is something, um, I, you know, so empathy labs are kind of, you know, those are really like 
they're widespread in within like <laughs> UX and there are, you know, there's quite a few people who think they're, you know, they, they can be problematic. So pretty much like how, you know, can empathy labs be used in a non-problematic way? And like, if not, what is an alternative to those labs? I have too many hot takes here. Maureen, do you, do you want to take a first stab <laughs> or are you willing to listen to an endless pass it? I haven't participated in one before, so I can't answer and reply on and give my, you know, sense on empathy labs. Josh, you're going to have to go for it now. <laughs> no, we want those hot takes. I mean, I <laughs> no, I, I honestly think so many people have talked about this. And there, I think there were some talks earlier that, that pointed out maybe some of the weaknesses. One of my favorite books discussing that in a little bit more detail is, um, was it, Design Thinking in the New Spirit of Capitalism. And it's, it's such an uh, interesting and funny take on it from a researcher observing it where you know a lot of these empathy labs or design thinking methods and the whatnot are less focused on centering the actual people like human-centered design and more about just facilitating a bunch of people in power of privilege um, who want to have that nice clean cut schedule in a sense who are we prioritizing here and i would lean towards you know the concept that those techniques were generated so that it can be easier to do for people in power and not necessarily to include uh, people within underserved communities themselves. Um, so I think that's a really great critique. And in terms of empathy as a whole, I mean, there's so many different types of empathy. So we need to be a little bit clear about that too. I think empathy as a term, once again, plot, uh, tons, tons of documentation out there about the limits of this, but empathy can be used as a blanket term in a sense um, to cover up doing proper, um, thorough research. Um, in a sense, it can be used to mask and make the research process feel very nebulous or like, you know, we, we wave our wand and we do our empathy magic. We come out the other end, we're good. But what that usually ends up being, especially if you can't fully include folks from underserved communities over time consistently from kickoff, um, is you end up just flattening them, flattening them into sticky notes, into artifacts that are convenient to bend to your will. You can chop them up, you can dice it up, you can interpret uh, in ways that can support your organization um, in terms of like for-profit kind of goals. So it's, it's really, really hard. And I think maybe a better step to think about is like, it's not necessarily that the method is evil or bad. Um, it's more about who is in power, um, what are we trying to get at, right? Have the people in power conducted like a subjectivity statement? Are they acknowledging um, what's kind of hidden, uh, I guess, in a sense, or acknowledging those biases ahead of time? I'd be more curious in that uh, in the first place. And I, I don't want to be too mean about those things. <laughs> You're very diplomatic. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, on that note, thank you both for a wonderful talk to everybody who is tuned in. Please head over to the YouTube page and hit the like button to show your appreciation for this talk. And while you're there at youtube.com forward slash inclusive design 24, why not hit the subscribe button and stay in touch with us into the future after we wrap up for today. A reminder that Inclusive Design 24 is a respectful community. We have a code of conduct and you'll find it linked on every page of our website. Inclusive Design 24 2022 was brought to you through the generosity of our many supporters. Intopia, Fable, Barrier Break, TPGI, UX for the Win, Equal Entry, Infoaxia, Intuit, the Law Office of Laney Feingold, Adrian Roselli LLC and WebAble. As I mentioned at the outset, this was the last talk of the conference, but we're not quite done yet. We will return on the hour with a post-conference uh, debriefing with the crew where we may be a little baggier around the eyes than we were 24 hours ago, but we nevertheless hope you will join us then for a few final thoughts. Josh, Maureen, Crystal, thank you very much for your time today.